Ayabuan, may you live long. Welcome to the next section of our series on apophatic antifragility. And this part of the series is going to be about quantum uncertainty. And let's start by taking a look at Dhamma theory. So it's very fashionable these days for teachers, especially in the West, to compare the Buddha's teaching to quantum mechanics. And uh, I'll tell you why I think that's a bad name. Because mechanics makes you think of something very certain, mechanical. <laughs> you put in this input, you always get that output. Something very repeatable, very reliable, very well understood something that a person of average intelligence can grasp. Uh, I mean, uh, they don't give you an IQ test uh, if, you, if you apply for a job as an auto mechanic. <laughs> you don't have to be a member of Mensa. <laughs> so quantum mechanics gives the impression that it's a very well understood field, but actually quantum mechanics is developing and changing all the time. And quantum mechanics actually deals with uncertainty. The famous uh, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, we don't know if the cat is alive or dead until we look. And then it's too late. <laughs> so the quantum world is a very strange place. It's not like our ordinary reality. And really, neither is the Buddha's teaching. And maybe that's where these people get the idea uh, that quantum mechanics and Buddhism have something in common. That and the fact that the Buddha also deals in uncertainty and probability. But they do so in completely different ways. And we'll explain how that is. Uh, but first I want to explain why I don't like this name quantum mechanics. I think it would be more appropriate to call it uh, quantum probability or maybe quantum improbability. <laughs> well, the, the one that I really like is quantum uncertainty. Quantum uncertainty, because we can never really be sure what's going on in the quantum world. And that's okay. We can still get uh, results, but they're not repeatable results. They're not the kind of results you can take home to, and put in the bank. Uh, they're not tangible. They're probabilistic. In other words, maybe this will happen, or maybe that will happen, to some degree of confidence, but never fully certain. And it's similar in spiritual life. Um, we know, for example, that if you apply the Buddha's process, the Noble Eightfold Path, in your life, with a reasonable amount of diligence, and you follow the original instructions, not somebody else's interpretation, that it's very likely, it's very probable, that you will advance in self-realization. And uh, if you follow the process all the way to the end, you might even attain enlightenment, which for us is our hunt ship. But there's nothing sure about it. We can't say for sure whether a given individual Maybe the Buddha can, but we can't say for sure who is going to attain enlightenment or when they're going to attain. And even the person themselves doesn't know this until it happens. So what's the difference? Because both the Buddhist teaching and quantum mechanics, or whatever we're going to call it, address uncertainty and unpredictability. Uncertainty means we can't be sure uh, exactly what's going to happen. And unpredictability means we can't be sure exactly when. So this uncertainty, this vagueness, this fuzziness, uh, it's not the kind of thing that you would expect from a word like mechanics. <laughs> so I think mechanics is misleading. 
Another thing that's misleading is to compare the Buddha's teaching to quantum mechanics um, kind of uses science to prop up or, or promote or lend authority to the Buddhist teaching. And that's not at all necessary. The Buddhist teaching is quite sufficient in itself, doesn't require any support from outside. So really what, uh, what they're doing, I think, is uh, decreasing our trust or our faith in the Buddhist teaching uh, by propping it up with science or something outside it. Because actually the approach of science is very different. Scientific uncertainty is statistical, inductive. It's based on the past and therefore it's fragile. And you know in our, in our series here we're using a special definition of fragile which is non-linearly sensitive to the unexpected events, noise, uncertainty, uh, improbability, things that are unpredictable, that happen only once in a blue moon. And when they do, a scientific theory generally blows up. And the reason why is what we're going to talk about in, in this video. However, Buddha's teaching is not like that. The Buddha's uncertainty is probabilistic, deductive, and future-facing. That makes it anti-fragile, because the Buddha already takes into account literally everything that could happen, no matter how unlikely. Uh, and that's our definition of anti-fragile. Anti-fragile is defined as something that benefits from uh, non-linearity. In fact, it benefits non-linearly from non-linearity. <laughs> so the more uncertain, the more noisy, uh, the more unpredictable, the more uh, improbable the events that happen, the more we benefit from them. How is this possible? Well, that's what this series is all about. Let's go into some definitions. I know you all love definitions. <laughs> but we have to be certain of what we're talking about here. Otherwise, it's easy to get confused. First, let's define statistics. A noun, meaning the practice or science of collecting and analyzing numerical data in large quantities, especially for the purpose of inferring proportions in a whole from those in a representative sample. Oh boy, could I pick this one apart. <laughs> this is right from the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> so I didn't make this up. I don't know why they call it a science here. It's actually simply a technique. Numerical analysis or statistical analysis deals with the past. It, it's about what happened. It already happened. It's done with. It's over. And we, we kept notes. We, we maintained a ledger throughout the whole experience. Now we're going to add up and find it the totals. But the part that I really like here is especially for the purpose of inferring proportions in a whole from those in a representative sample. Okay, we got you now. <laughs> this is inferential reasoning. Inferential reasoning says, well, I see this and this and this, and now I'm going to conclude that everything is like that. <laughs> There's a good story. There was a wise man going for a walk in the hills of Scotland, and he had several disciples with him. So on their way, walking through the hills, probably in the rain, because it always rains there, uh, they see a sheep. And the wise man asks his newest pupil, you see that sheep? What color are the sheep of Scotland? And the student says, well, that's a white sheep. So all the sheep in Scotland must be white. And then he asks his uh, middle student, well, what about the, the sheep in Scotland? 
And he says, well, it's hard to draw any conclusions about the sheep of Scotland, but here we are in Middleshire, or Devonshire, <laughs> someplace like that. And so we can say at least the sheep in Devonshire are white. Finally, he asks his most advanced student, what conclusions can you draw about the sheep in Scotland? And he says, well, I don't know anything about the sheep in Scotland, but that one's white. So then they go on walking for some time. And finally, the students ask, well, what do you say, sir? What do you think uh, we can infer from uh, our observation of the sheep? He says, well, I would say that uh, that sheep was white, at least on the side facing us. So you see, the wiser a person is, the less they are prone to inference or generalizing from a small sample to the whole. Now you could say that uh, I have a drop of water here and the drop of water is wet. So that means that all water is wet. Well, it depends on what you mean by water. Are you talking about ice? It's not wet. Go to Antarctica, the snow is like powder. It's like dust, like sand in a desert. Or you go uh, to a volcano and there's steam coming out of a vent. That steam is not wet. It'll scald you if you try to touch it. See? As soon as we say, this is that, then we have to go on and specify a whole bunch of conditions. There's always limitations, and we don't always know where those limitations are. So this is the disease of science. The disease of science takes a small sample, a few laboratory experiments, and then goes to the extreme and says, well, the whole universe is like that. Well, we don't know that. There could be some place on some distant planet or some other galaxy where it's not like that. And we have no way of finding that out. We're knowing it. So we have, again, an epistemological shortcoming, an epistemological deficiency. And we'll get into why this happens and, and how it goes on later on in the movie. Now, we also want to define inductive reasoning, because that's what statistics does. Inductive is an adjective a reasoning characterized by the inference of general laws from particular instances. We see one snowflake, it's got six sides, we say, okay, all snowflakes have six sides. But mostly they do, but there's always going to be some exceptions. <laughs> the universe is not bound by our abstractions. Just because we think that something is so, doesn't mean it is so. For example, human beings are very fond of straight lines, circles and cubes and shapes like that. You don't ever see those in, in nature. Well, you might say, well, the, the sun is a circular object, isn't it? But if we measure it very precisely, we find it's not. It's an ellipsoid. It's not a circle. And the same with the Earth or any other planet. So there is no such thing as a perfect circle, a straight line, a cube in nature. These are man-made abstractions, and we're going to see that so many of the things that we believe in are true are actually simply uh, abstractions superimposed on the reality. Now, let's define probability. A noun in mathematics, the extent to which an event is likely to occur, measured by the ratio of the expected cases to the whole number of cases possible. So if I'm flipping a coin, huh, what's the probability it's going to come up heads? Well, again, we have to determine the extent. Am I talking about one trial, two trials, a thousand, a million, ten billion? The more trials I have, and the more uh, truly random my coin flipping process is, the closer that number is going to come to 
0.5. Uh, if the probability of the flipped coin landing is 1.0, <laughs> it's definitely going to land. <laughs> but then to see whether it comes up heads or tails, that's random. So the extent, if we assume an unlimited extent, again, this is inductive reasoning, then we can say, okay, the probability of a coin coming up heads or tails is 0.5. But in any particular instance, for example, let's say I just flipped nine coins and all nine come up heads. What is the probability of the next one coming up heads as well? Well, the more times I flip and get heads in a row, the more likely it is the next one's going to be tails. This is a, a probabilistic fact. Now, if you say statistically, we've analyzed every coin flip ever made and found out that uh, the probability is 0.5. So the next coin you flip is also going to be 0.5. Well, that would be true if we were talking about an isolated extent, an extent of 1. But if we're talking about an extent of 10, Nine heads in a row is very rare. Ten heads in a row is twice as rare. So we're talking about one to the second power times two to the second power times three to the second power, you see, all the way out to ten. That's how rare ten heads in a row is. That's the probability. Uh, you invert that number, divide it, divide it into one. And you have the probability of the tenth one coming up uh, heads as well. You see how this works? It's a little bit counterintuitive because we are taught to think statistically, but the world is probabilistic. We are taught to reason inductively, but the world is deductive. So let's define that. Deductive is an adjective. Reasoning characterized by the inference of particular instances from a general law based on logical analysis of available facts. See the difference? In inductive reasoning, we're taking a limited number of samples and saying, well, that represents the whole. In deductive reasoning, we're going to say, okay, we flipped this coin nine times. And so we don't know anything about the infinity of coin flips. All we know are these nine instances, and they always came up heads. So knowing that a coin flip is basically a random operation, the probability of the next one being heads is very, very small, tiny, tiny. That's a deductive conclusion by probability. I'm not going to explain all the intricacies of these things. It's up to you to do your homework, okay? But the, the point to carry away from this discussion is that we have been trained, we have been enculturated with linear thinking based on the application of straight lines, uh, cubes, circles, and other abstractions on a very unruly world which doesn't necessarily follow our ideas of what should be so. And we have been trained to use inductive reasoning and statistical logic to determine the probabilities of the consequences of our events. As a result, our predictions are wrong so much of the time. Huh? So much of the time. Even though everybody's brain is constantly working, trying to figure out what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. But because we don't uh, acknowledge that the world is probabilistic, we don't acknowledge that actually deductive thinking is what's required to determine the likelihood of something. And in deductive thinking, which is based on the logical analysis of available facts, we know the, the base of facts that our thinking is drawn from, and we know its extent, we know its limits. And we know that there's a whole big universe out there beyond that knowledge 
that we haven't looked at or we can't look at. So we know that our knowledge has limits and we know that the reliability of our predictions has limits. This is a much more humble approach than the uh, you know Victorian steampunky kind of uh, masters of the universe mood <laughs> that says, great, we have a steam engine, and so the next thing we're going off to Mars. Eh, it's not quite that simple, folks. There are always unforeseen barriers and nonlinearities in nature. And as soon as we find something that's approximately a straight line, we think that's going to go on forever? No. <laughs> in fact, the longer it goes on in a straight line, the more likely it is to deviate. The longer the stock market has gone up, the more likely it is to go down. And I think we're about due for an uh, instance of that <laughs> because the stock market's been going up for an awfully long time. Uh, yet people are poorer than ever. How is that possible? Well, somebody's making a lot of money, just not us. <laughs> so anyway, so we have an approach, two different approaches to reasoning, logic, prediction, and reality. One is based on inductive reasoning, the other is on deductive reasoning. One is based on statistics, the other is based on probability. And we'll soon see that science has a strong bias toward statistical knowledge and inferential reasoning, whereas the Buddhist teaching has a strong bias toward the other, okay? Deductive logic and probabilistic reasoning. And this is why science and typical uh, materialistic thinking uh, of any culture is bound to be fragile and why the Buddha's teaching is anti-fragile. So let's go on. We're going to talk about Dhamma theory. The Dhamma theory is the ontological theory behind the Buddha's teaching. And it's talked about in a remarkable series of books called Abhidhamma. And I'm not going to get into the controversy of how Abhidhamma arose. Uh, for me, it's fine to know that Abhidhamma is a very detailed ontological analysis of the Buddha's teaching. Now, a long time ago, I made a challenge to all of our viewers to do an ontological analysis of the Buddha's teaching. So far, nobody's taken it up. Uh, but uh, if you want to cheat a little, <laughs> or if you want some hints, go read up on Abhidhamma. Anyway... The Buddha's attainment of rightly self-awakened enlightenment is very likely the most singularly improbable event in the history of the world. So, apophatic improbability is the nature of a Buddha because his enlightenment is something that cannot be spoken in words. It cannot be communicated by symbols. It cannot be reasoned about or discussed by any kind of logic. However, the path to that enlightenment is known. And so we have a basis for probabilistic reasoning based on deduction from the Buddha's experiences. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be upset with me <laughs> because they have based their careers their whole lives on inferential reasoning and statistical logic. How does that show up in the Buddhist teaching? Well, there's some big teachers out there who have like a zillion Facebook followers and have sold a whole bunch of books or uh, they get views on YouTube in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. There are people out there like that. But as far as I can tell, what they're presenting has very little to do with the original teaching of the Buddha. Well, what they have done is superimposed a framework over the Buddha's teaching that has lots of nice, neat, straight lines and uh, lots of nice inductive logic 
Uh, and because we're used to that kind of thinking, we're trained in that kind of thinking by school and, and so on, they become the, the lucky fools who get the worldly success from their presenting what their version of the Buddha's teaching is. But we don't think they're uh, uh, going to last as long as the, uh, the more humble monks who are less popular, less well-known, but who do their homework and present the Buddha's teaching as it is. Like I think uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations of uh, the various suttas are going to be around, they're going to be with us for a long, long time probably even longer than Tanisaro's, and they're pretty good. But uh, some of the other people who are teaching Buddhism, um, you know, as, as soon as they disappear, they're going to be forgotten. As soon as they stop uh, being promoted by big publishing companies and appearing on the, the right websites and so on, uh, they're going to be gone and they're going to be replaced by the next generation of popularizers. Okay, so what makes this, what, what, what makes it possible for me to say this with a great degree of confidence is that the Buddha's teaching is improbable. It's very unlikely that such a thing could even exist, that such a being could appear on this planet probably the most improbable thing that's ever happened on this planet, at least for a long, long time. But, you know, there are a lot of people who sell lots of books. There are a lot of people who, who get uh, viewers, views in the millions on YouTube, you know, and they're mostly talking about junk, something that's, that's maybe entertaining, but it's not going to really help your life. So it's not really such an unusual thing, not such a rare thing, really, to get popular, to get fame, to get money, to get backing. But then you think about, well, what are the conditions that you have to have to get that? You have to be uh, popular enough and easy to understand enough to have a wide audience. And you have to be giving a message that the people with money who back authors and, and public personalities will want to invest in. See? So you, you have to serve somebody's agenda to get that big. And of course, the Buddha doesn't serve anybody's agenda. <laughs> the Buddha is completely independent, and so is his teaching. It's not going to make you rich. Well, it's going to make you rich in uh, inside, <laughs> but not externally. So the world doesn't much care about that. The world would like to be able to say, I'm a Buddhist, and, uh, you know, get the uh, social recognition of that, but without having to go through all that trouble of meditation and, and giving up uh, things that are against the precepts, and, you know, all that trouble. So the Buddha's teaching, the original teaching, the actual teaching of the Buddha, is not something that's going to become popular anytime soon. <laughs> because the teaching of the Buddha is his description of how things appear to the mind of a Tathagata, a fully enlightened being. And since, as far as we know, there's only one fully enlightened being in history, the Buddha is very much in the minority. And the statistical mindset says, well, wait a minute, if there's only one of these guys, how could what he is saying possibly be correct? Well, somehow or other, he got a lot of influence in the world, but we think it actually means this. And so they go on interpreting it, changing the teaching according to their own ideas and superimposing uh, ideas that come from psychology and sociology and politics and business and who knows what else on top of the original teaching to make it more palatable because the original teaching of the Buddha is tough it's very uncompromising very radical and you don't get to be a best-selling author simply by being uncompromisingly radical <laughs> 
you have to serve somebody's agenda. And you have to have something message that's widely palatable to a large number of people. And the Buddha is just not. Tathagata. Tata means suchness, that which is, the way it is. Huh? Uh, agata, gone beyond. So the Tathagata has gone beyond. Gone, gone, gone beyond. Gone beyond, beyond. That's the nature of the Tathagata. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate. Huh? So the Tathagata is a person who is outside of any reality that we can understand or speculate. And so he is reporting his experience. He is reporting his view. He's describing how things look from where he is. Is that going to be familiar to us? Is that going to be easy for us to understand? If it is, there's something wrong. It should be like really hard to understand. <laughs> and actually it is. You have to practice the Buddha's teaching enough to get some realization before it becomes even remotely understandable. Uh, at first, when you start reading, it's going to be completely counterintuitive. But that's improbability, right? So we talked in the beginning of the series, in the very first video, the introduction, about the infinite improbability drive. Well, this is it. The Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's teaching and the Buddha himself are so improbable that they fall outside the realm of any other system. That's why we have to study them as they are. And if we're going to use system thinking at all, which I think is a good idea, it has to be built on the Buddha's teaching as it is, not as we'd like it to be. Uh, not a, a, as a superimposed a system of linear statistical inductive thinking, but as a nonlinear system that uses deductive thinking and nonlinear relations. Because from the Buddha's point of view, the familiar world of substantial objects and enduring personal identities is just an illusory conceptual construct fashioned by the mind from the underlying dhammas. In other words, there is a reality, and that's called dhammas. We'll define dhammas in a minute. Dhamma simply means a thing, something that is, something that has real existence, that has ontological verity. But then, if you watched our video on no self, on the mula pariyaya, the root sequence, it describes this process where we inject our own ideas into the reality and we create for ourselves a view of reality that contains additional elements besides what's actually there. And this is called self, ego. Sometimes we call it the soul, I, me, and concepts like mine, and so forth. So we have this bad habit, uh, and this is called ignorance. <laughs> Because we don't know that what this process is doing is starting a, a mechanical, more or less mechanical process of dependent origination. Because it's based on desire. We look at the world, we look at the dhammas, and we say, well, that's not good enough. I want something more. And so we form a desire. And then we start building on that desire and trying to make it come into being and so forth. And really all we're doing is setting ourselves up for terrible suffering. But we don't know this. And because we don't know it, because we don't realize that life is suffering, being is suffering, uh, especially desire and, and attachment 
or suffer. We don't know that the cause of this suffering is our own effort, our own efforts to fulfill our desires. And we don't see that there is a cessation of suffering based on the cessation of this process of dependent origination. And we don't know the path to the cessation of suffering. So the Four Noble Truths, uh, or lack of knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, is the ignorance that is the root cause of our suffering. So instead of living in the world as it really is, we live in a world that we invent and overlay on top of the real world. Because of this, the reality of the common entities of everyday life is merely consensual, derived from the basis of the dhammas by an inductive process. In other words, I want to exist as a separate self. So using the process described in the root sequence, I inject the idea of I into everything. And I do this so often as a habit that every time I experience something, I inject this I concept into it. So all the sense inputs, all of the impressions that come in through the senses are then overlaid with this concept of I, the self. And I do this actually several times a second by habit. It consumes an enormous amount of mental energy. Um, but what I've done now is I've created the illusion that I really exists. And I made the comparison before to a, a movie or a video where you, you have a bunch of consecutive still pictures, but they run by so fast that it looks like a moving picture. It's an illusion. So we actually have all these moments of reality, of dhammas. But then we project these ideas of I and mine and so on onto this reality. And we do it so often that it appears to be continuously existing. So we say, well, I exist. <laughs> Anytime I look, there I am. Everywhere I go, <laughs> I find myself. Yes, because you're taking every single p impression that comes in through the senses and adding I to it. And you do it mechanically, you do it uh, chronically, uh, you do it habitually. So this is the first and the, the greatest illusion. And then we create many, many more. I, then comes mine, then comes yours, then comes ours, and uh, so many other things. I mean, even time actually is an illusion of this same nature, space-time, and so forth. That's getting way ahead of our story. <laughs> These are the things I think about in the middle of the night. Thus, things like living beings, persons, men, women, animals, and other apparently persistent objects are actually only mental constructs. What about a chair? Huh? I'm sitting in a chair now. But if I were to take this chair and chop it to pieces and put all the pieces in a pile, is it still a chair? Nothing has changed except the relationship of the pieces. All the material that was in the chair is still there. But now it's not a chair. Why? We can't use it as a chair. So we have this mental construct chair. And what it really means is something I can sit in. And if something loses that quality of being sittable, then it's not a chair anymore, even though it might be the same exact physical structures and materials. So in other words, the world that we live in is composed of labels like chair, window, floor, ceiling, robe, nose, <laughs> human being, animal, and so on. And of course, the original one is I, as we discussed. But these are all simply mental constructs. They're not dhammas. And they don't have the same reality as the dhammas. We infer their existence from our perceptions and fabricate a consensus reality by agreeing on their nature and names. 
So the premise of the Buddha's teaching is that we must distinguish conceptual constructs that are mistakenly grasped as real from entities that possess actual ontological reality, the dhammas. So this is where dhamma theory comes in, so that we know what is a dhamma and what is not a dhamma. This is where the study of Abhidhamma is very helpful. But of course, the, the whole Buddha's teaching is based on this principle, to know what is real, to know what is made up, and then to ditch the fabricated reality and embrace the actual reality. And when we do that, the whole world looks very different. The whole experience of life is transformed, and that's enlightenment. So proceeding from this distinction, the Theravada suttas and Abhidhamma describe the dhammas as building blocks of actuality. The actual reality that we experience is dhamma. That is our immediate experience. However, then we have a layer of reflexive experience, of processing, uh, overlaying that immediate experience with our interpretation of it. And as we have discussed here several times, <laughs> we add a layer of unreality that we infer exists. Well, I exist, don't you? Oh, yes, I exist. Certainly you do, too. <laughs> and we all go around agreeing on this nonsense. This reminds me of a story. In World War II, there were some prisoners of war, American prisoners, and they decided to keep up their morale by creating a, a, a dog, an imaginary dog. They even named the dog, you know, Spot or something like that. And then they would sit around telling stories about this dog. Well, a few weeks went by, and then one of the men reported to the, uh, the leader, you know, today I saw a Spot. And he's going, ha ha, yeah, that's great. No, I actually saw him. See, so what started out as a story gradually became more and more concretely real until someone actually saw like this. There are so many studies in psychology how a person's reality can be changed by association. Uh, the Stockholm effect and like that. You can look that up. So uh, we know that association with admirable people association with enlightened people tends to cause the same attitudes to manifest in others around them. But that's why we become monks. That's why we join a monastery. That's why we accept a teacher. But don't try to understand Buddha's teaching without a good teacher, because it takes the experience, the realization, to see things from the Buddha's point of view. Otherwise, we will misinterpret his instructions, his teachings, and we'll get some wrong result. Because for the Buddha, there are no sharp distinctions among ontology, epistemology, philosophy, and phenomenological psychology. It's all one package. Huh? If you see things like this, then they're going to look like that. So I could explain all these terms, but I'm running out of time. Uh, you have to do your homework, look them up, and understand how they're related. And then you'll see that the Buddha's teaching actually encompasses all of these things, seamlessly. It's a remarkable thing. The Buddha's teaching analyzes experiential reality in terms of the classes of consciousness and correlates their factors and functions with their objects and physiological bases. In other words, the Buddha says, when consciousness, the eye, and vision, uh, the object of vision, come together, then we have seeing, we have the perceptions of sight, and similarly with the other senses. So uh, while this isn't maybe earth-shaking to you, it's very, very profound because he's saying that consciousness is actually simply the result of the senses and their objects coming together. Without that, we don't have consciousness. Uh, like in the middle of the night when we're fully asleep, there's no consciousness. You can only remember 
the experience afterwards and say, oh yes, I was in deep sleep. I don't remember anything. <laughs> Thus, the Buddha's teaching provides a map of reality showing how the types of consciousness relate to one another and to material phenomena in the process of experience. So right now we're going through this experience, the experience of life. And because of lack of a map, or maybe we have the wrong map, we're suffering. Keep running into walls. <laughs> Things don't work out the way we think. Huh? We expect one thing to happen, something completely else occurs. So this is because we're not following the actual map, but a map that a bunch of people got together and more or less randomly constructed uh, by their own wishful thinking. The Buddha's map completely demolishes all of that wishful thinking, that speculated inductive thought, and it gets right down to the actual basis, the Dhammas. And we're going to go into this in tremendous detail in this series. The Buddha's analysis of mind, its actions and objects is not motivated by mere curiosity, but by the overriding aim of cessation of suffering. It's not knowledge for its own sake. That's why the Buddha never tried to characterize, for example, all the details of material phenomena, chemistry, physics, and so on. He simply said, well, there's a few elements, <laughs> earth, air, water, fire, ether, mind, intelligence, like that. Uh, so he didn't bother to get into uh, all the chemicals of the periodic series and so on like that. Why? Because it has no bearing on attaining enlightenment or cessation of suffering. So the Buddha's teaching is very streamlined. It contains only the information that we need to attain Nibbana. So don't fault the Buddha's teaching because he doesn't have a complete exposition of uh, quantum physics in there. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. And the only reason why people even bring it up is that it shares a few characteristics, but there's, there's actually more difference than similarity. And you'll find that the people who talk like this, the Buddhist teaching is similar to quantum mechanics, they don't actually know much about either the Buddhist teaching or quantum mechanics. If you question them closely, you'll find that their knowledge is very shallow. But the Buddha's teaching is deep, extremely deep. The Buddha traces the origin of suffering to impure mental attitudes, greed, hatred, and delusion. That's why we're suffering. There's no need for some abstract metaphysical jargon or any kind of psychological speculation or any of the other things that people commonly substitute for the Buddha's teaching in his name. The real thing that's needed is to purify our consciousness of these impure desires. Thus, his phenomenological psychology takes the form of psychological ethics, not in the narrow moral sense, but as comprehensive guidelines to noble living and mental purification, leading to cessation of suffering, Nibbana. So, in other words, the, the vinaya, the precepts or the rules of Buddhism, are not a morality. Remember back in our series on integrity, we talked about the difference between morality and integrity. That morality is a, a normalistic point of view where things are judged right and wrong and punished. You don't get rewarded for doing right, but you get punished for doing wrong. Well, the Buddhist system is not like that. Uh, religion also takes a moralistic point of view that there's some guy up in the sky taking down everything we do and then is going to deal out retribution for our mistakes. And the Buddha doesn't buy that either. But he says that we have conscience. And if we live a life of conscience, we have this rare quality called integrity. So... Uh, if you haven't uh, gone through this series of being integrity, please go back and do that now, because without integrity, 
nothing works. And especially the Buddha's teaching doesn't work. So if somebody is presenting uh, their own ideas, basically, and calling it the Buddha's teaching, well, then we have an integrity problem, don't we? And if somebody is presenting different practices, saying they're from the Buddha, but they're actually just whatever that person likes to do, wants to do, then we have an integrity problem. So we find in most cases that people nowadays have rejected the Vinaya with the argument that it's just morality. So killing is all right, having sex is all right, intoxication and cheating, lying, stealing, it's all fine. You know, just sit down and meditate once in a while. We don't buy that. Uh, in our experience, you will not be successful in either understanding or applying the Buddha's teaching until you develop integrity. And so please go back and watch Being Integrity. I think it's our fourth or fifth series. I didn't complete it yet, <laughs> but there's enough there that you can understand our point of view. That integrity means to reduce or eliminate suffering in yourself and those around you. And that is the actual aim of everything in the Buddha's teaching. So, I Buan, may you live long. Buddha Saranai, may Buddha bless your life. <laughs>